please. Okay, so welcome. Uh, my name is Katerina. I'm a Zen Shiatsu practitioner, healer, uh, holistic, integrative coach. And I wanted to share with you today on um, the invitation of the Chicago Public Library some information about the Chinese medicine five elements. So as a Zen Shiatsu therapist, I've been working with this material since 2010 and began teaching Shiatsu, which is a holistic bodywork practice um, based in Chinese medicine. It's a Japanese practice. Um, I've been teaching since 2013. And since I began teaching, this aspect of Chinese medicine is something that always uh, resonated most deeply with me. It's something that really stood out as a key point that I could, um, could help open up my worldview a little bit more, my understanding of myself, my body, how my mind works, and my connection with nature, with life, with all of these things that I experience throughout the world. So I found it to be very simple, very profound, and just a really kind of beautiful and poetic way of weaving all of these aspects of what I understand as interconnectedness. And so uh, we'll be going through each of these five elements. Um, uh, as you may know, maybe you don't know, um, Chinese medicine was established over 2000 years ago. It's an ancient form of medicine, time tested, still practiced to this day. Um, acupuncture, this is what acupuncturists practice, if you're familiar with that. Um, and has similar, um, some similar overlapping principles as um, India's Ayurvedic medic medical system, as well uh, as Tibetan Buddhist medicine. Um, these are all variations of, of Asian medicines that are rooted in indigenous wisdom. And so I've taken time to study a bit from American and Asian instructors um, here in the US. I haven't had a chance yet to go to Asia, but uh, well, not China at least, but I spent some time in India. Um, but so I wanted to share with you all of the kind of information that I've gathered over the years and have studied and, and put into practice through my, my holistic therapy practice and through coaching as well. So these five elements, um, and before we, we get to jump in just yet, um, you're welcome to throw any comments you have in the chat box. Um, I'll try to get to those at the very end of this talk. Um, but so, okay, the five elements is, they are this, um, this model of understanding uh, the physiology, the movement of energies through the actual body. Um, they have correlations with aspects of the personality, the psychology, the mind, and obviously these are elements that we see in nature uh, through ecology as well. Um, so we'll start by just looking at the view. Chinese medicine uh, has roots in Taoist practice. So Taoism is an ancient form of uh, cosmological thinking. Uh, you could say it's a religious practice. That's maybe debatable. It's a spiritual practice. It's a form of cultivation. Um, I don't claim to be a Taoist practitioner in any way, um, but I am a student of life. And so I'll share with you a little bit about what I've learned along the way. So the view that we're entering into from where these five elements, the understanding of these five elements came from, as I mentioned, comes from um, Taoism. And so I wanted to give you a, a short excerpt from the Tao Te Ching. Um, the Tao Te Ching in chapter 42 says, and what is the Tao? Let's start there. What is the Tao? It's a big concept. Um, and it's non-conceptual at the same time. The Tao is, you can think of, this flow, this movement of life. Let's put it very simply. You know you're feeling a flow state when things are happening harmoniously for you, quite effortlessly for you, and, um, and you're progressing along the path of your life, whatever way that might look. Um, some people call this our connection to God. Some people call this our... Um, embodiment of the Dharma. There's so many ways to look at this. I think they're all very similar and resonant and, um, and have very distinct uh, kind of expressions in the world. So this, to give us an understanding, um, the Tao is, we could think of as the origin of all things, the origin of, mm, of the universe. 
you could say. That kind of spark of the Big Bang, if you want to put it in, in terms of, of quantum physics or space. So the Tao, which is kind of all encompassing, the Tao gives birth to one. One gives birth to two, two gives birth to three, and three gives birth to the 10,000 things. So this is kind of an understanding of how um, this aspect of oneness can continually branch off into mul multiplicities. And all these multiplicities into the 10,000 things becomes the phenomena that we live in. This is all of life, all of reality. From the moment we wake up in the morning to when we go to sleep, being born, dying, all of this all encompassing and everything we experience in between the 10,000 things. And so these five elements arise out of this fundamental understanding of these 10,000 things. They're kind of a distillation of these 10,000 things. Um, so I want to just first point you to, I hope you can see here on the left side of the screen is this yin yang symbol. You've probably seen this in pop culture and wherever. This yin yang is a representation of this movement of the Tao, this all encompassing nature. Um, ultimately the Tao is beyond concept, but the Tao, which is nameless, formless, beyond anything we could even conceive of or think of, gives birth to one. And what is that one? It might just be this, you can think of this solid sphere, a circle. And that one gives birth to two, this polarity or dualism, which is the yin and the yang, these varying aspects of, um, of nature, the yin and the yang. Also known, the symbol is also known as the taiji. And within those polar opposites, so that duality, there's the seed of the other, the seed of the opposite. So you can see within that white segment, there's a dot of black within the black segment, there's a spot of white as well. And that's constantly transforming and changing within itself. So it's just a little bit of the philosophical background. I don't wanna to get too deep into it for today. That's for a future course, if you'd like to continue learning about this material. But that's to give you a little bit of a foundation of the background. So from the duality arises these, you know, you could say the, the five elements up here. So the five elements, as I mentioned, is a model for understanding medicine. Um, it is a mo it put into practice as a medical practice um, in classical Chinese medicine and ch uh, traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, as you probably heard of. Um, and so I want to give you an understanding of how um, how these elements interact with one another. So we have a few different cycles. So you saw on the first page, going back here, these five elements are arranged in a, in a kind of a circle here. So going into this, we'll look at the creation cycle. So each of these elements creates one another. They produce one another, and let's look at that. So this is called the creation, production, generation cycle. Either one of these words you can use depending on your translation. So essentially, Fire creates earth, earth creates metal, metal creates water, water creates wood, and it continues in this productive generative cycle. How does that happen? It's really simple and just so beautiful when you think about it. So fire, when fire burns something, it becomes ash, and that ash becomes compost or returns to the earth. Anything that we've digested, from the heat of our digestive system, eliminates into waste and returns back to the earth. Okay, so fire produces earth. Earth then produces metal. What are metals? We see precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, all the metals and minerals and crystals of the earth are deep into the earth. So earth condenses and produces metals. And then metals are a way of structuring and harnessing and creating water. Uh, so you think of condensation, for example, water collects on, on the metal. And this will make more sense as we go, so don't worry if you're getting lost a little bit. So just stay with me. Um, so water creates wood. How does water create wood? Well, you need water to grow plants and trees and anything. We need water to, to fertilize and to, well, not fertilize, to hydrate life. Wood creates fire. How do we build a fire? By throwing logs of wood on it. Very simple, and it can continue to go deeper. So then this is a creation production cycle. So this is how we understand each of the elements 
are moving into one another, transforming one another, and developing one another. So we go to another cycle. This is called the control cycle. So control or destruction cycle. So this is actually where the elements keep one another in check. It's kind of like a big ecological, cosmological checks and balances system. It keeps the balance of nature in balance. So what does that mean? Fire, you can see the arrows pointing here, kind of in the star shape. So fire keeps metal in check. How does that happen? Well, if you heat metal hot enough, it bends. Uh, if you put fire on metal, right, it bends the metal. So you can change the shape of metal when enough fire is applied. Metal changes wood. Well, how does that work? You think of a metal saw or a metal ax chopping wood. It changes the shape of the wood. It creates a change in the wood. So it keeps wood in check or uh, controls, shapes, destroys, many different ways to look at it, keeps it in check. So then wood, if you put enough wood on the earth, kind of like mulch um, or a dead tree falls in the forest, um, it dampens and contains the earth. So it, it um, yeah, it contains the earth. So then earth creates water, or keeps water in check, I'm sorry, earth controls water. So if you put enough earth on a pool of water, for example, it'll soak up all of that water and it'll be soggy, kind of muddy, muddy water, right? And then water keeps fire in balance. Water controls fire. So if you put enough water on a big flaming fire, it'll put out the fire, right? It'll totally extinguish the fire. So this is the checks and balances system, the control cycle. This is how nature is naturally always keeping itself in check. And we can see this even in, in our environmental crises that are happening, very much so. So when, you know, we've exhausted all of, well, I won't go too much into that, but, but you can see how this is a way that we're keeping um, nature in balance. And it keeps itself in balance anyway. Okay, so then finally, I want to introduce you to what this means for our lives. How do we apply it into our life? So in Chinese medicine, uh, when you go to see an acupuncturist or an herbalist um, or myself uh, for shiatsu therapy, we might look at something called the daily cycle. So this is how these five elements are expressed throughout your day. So basically, there are different times of the day in which each of these elements are most apparent. They show up the strongest. So let's start at the beginning of the day. They actually, in Chinese medicine, they go on an old world calendar, um, which is when you wake up at 4 a.m. to tend to the fields. If you're a farmer in agriculture, or if you're a monk, you wake up at 4 a.m. to do your morning practices. And what do you do first thing when you wake up in the morning? Let's say it's 4 a.m. You can adjust it to your modern schedule. So let's say it's 4 a.m. and you take your first breath of fresh air. This is the time when your lung energy is, uh, is waking up. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet and that I'm mentioning now is that each of these five elements correlates to the organs of your body. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But you'll see each of these elements expresses in a certain time of day and these organs are activated and most you can say um, uh, most pronounced at specific times of the day. Um, and so first thing in the morning, you're taking that fresh breath of your lung, of, uh, of your lung chi. You're taking your, the lung chi in. Um, so that's your metal element. And then you have your large intestine, which is another metal element organ, um, which is when you would go to the bathroom, eliminate your bowels, your waste usually first thing in the morning if you have a healthy functioning body, healthy system. And then the next thing is you're gonna to wanna to have some breakfast. So this is your earth element, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., stomach. Then spleen is gonna help digest your breakfast. Again, I won't go too deep into this. This is a whole class in and of itself, but I wanna give you just a general overview. Um, then heart and small intestine is your fire element. So think about what happens at noon, between noon and 2 p.m. It's the hottest time of the day when fire is and light is most apparent. This is the time when you might be having lunch with your friends, your colleagues, that aspect of fire that connects us with other people. 
We'll talk more about that when we go into the details. And then water element time of the day, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. This is when you're gonna be making your final push um, throughout the last part of your work day, maybe starting to go home and unwind water, moving from that rush of activity, just like a rushing river, to the stillness of rest. And then we have another fire element time of the day in the evening between 7 and 11 p.m. And another aspect of fire is this, like I mentioned, this interpersonal connection. So this is when we'll have time with our family, our loved ones, our partner for connection. And then we come into the nighttime. So ideally by this time, by 11 p.m., you've, you're, you've hit the hay and you've gone to sleep. And 11 to 2 a.m. is when you'll be sleeping. And that's the wood element. So wood as we'll discuss, has to do with these aspects of visioning and dreaming for our lives. Um, how do we envision our best life and manifest that? Well, a lot of that happens when we're asleep and we're dreaming. And um, yeah, and we're sorting things out for ourselves through the dream state. Okay, so that's just a very quick run through of these five elements uh, daily cycle that if you were to, for instance, come to see me, to work with me for a session or for coaching, we would look at this a little bit more in depth with your life and, um, and come to understand uh, what are your natural rhythms? What are the ways in which you feel the most energy? What are, what are your most productive, potent times of the day? When do you feel the least amount of energy? When you really need to rest or you feel sluggish or any time of the day where you have a repeating pattern, so this is where medically speaking and looking at it from this holistic perspective, we can come to understand ourselves a lot better and make adjustments and changes to our lifestyle that can be more conducive with harmonizing with the elements, with having more free flowing energy and the ability to accomplish our goals and to do what we want to do throughout the days. So this is the way that we work with this daily cycle. Um, okay. So let's get into looking at each of the elements one by one. We have the fire element up top. So this might be a lot of information, but again, just see if you can just rest with it and uh, follow along. So the fire element, the, the main quality of the fire element is the spirit of presence. So if you think of somebody who is radiant and glowing, they have a strong, clear fire element within them. We all have all of these elements within us, but typically um, we are mostly exhibiting one element. Uh, we have a primary constitutional type, which I'll talk about a bit as well. But so the fire element um, is associated with our spirit, our heart itself, um, our quality of presence, and awareness in the world. So the season, there's seasons associated with each of these elements. The season of fire is summertime. We're coming into summertime right now. So you think about fire and summer as that time when there's the most heat, just like fire, there's the most warmth, there's the most light, it's the brightest time of the year, and there's the most radiance that can come out of us. This is the time of the year where we feel like we want to go outside and connect with people and make friends and go to festivals and be uh, outgoing much more than say the opposite of wintertime, for example, right? So summertime is our fire element. As I mentioned, the organs associated with fire are the heart, the pericardium, which is this um, anatomical encasement around the heart. Um, small intestines and triple warmer, which is unique to Chinese medicine, um, a function of the body. I won't go into detail about that yet, but these are the ways that it's also connected to our physiology, what's happening in our bodies. Uh, the emotion associated with the fire element is joy. So you think of somebody who is a bright, radiant spirit, they're joyful, maybe they're always smiling, and they have just kind of this um, glow about them. The other side of this fire element emotion is sorrow or melancholy. So this is where we get cases of people who fall into depression or even anxiety where there's too much fire energy moving. 
So depression, anxiety are fire element um, pathologies or imbalances. The personality of a person who is a fire element type is extroverted. They love being social. They're a social butterfly. They're outgoing. They love to travel, be out and about and connect with people. Connection is the primary motivating force for them. They love connecting with people. If they feel isolated or they've disconnected with somebody, it's the most terrible thing that could happen to a fire element person. So the virtues, there are virtues, there's enlightened qualities, you could say, the virtues of each of these elements. The virtue of the fire element is presence. It's the way that they shine. It's their insight, their ability to know themselves. And it's this quality of propriety. It's being at the right place at the right time, being in line with spirit, letting spirit move through them. So some of the challenges that a fire element type person might have um, is, like I mentioned, melancholy, um, perhaps the need to control themselves, to have keep things under control if things um, feel too big, for example. Um, or the fear of intimacy, the fear of vulnerability. So there's always this dance within connection. Connecting just the right amount is what allows you to embody your wisdom of the fire element. But sometimes there can be a closing off or um, a fear of intimacy and connection. And safety is usually a concern for the fire element. So I'm gonna have to breeze through these a little bit more quickly um, since we're already at the halfway point. But some of the other things I wanted to mention, some associations with the fire element are obviously heat and warmth, the sense of expansion, expanding out, um, effortlessness, the fire element, when they're in their flow state, when they're in that movement of the Tao and the Dharma, there's this sense of effortlessness. The fire element, another virtue is truth. They are embodied in truth. They're speaking truth and they're honest versus a fire element out of balance in someone can result in lying or deception and manipulation. And then another concern of the fire element is being seen, being heard, commitment is important to a healthy fire element type person and the sense of openness, openness to life. Okay, so going on to the next one we have, fire creates earth. So earth, the archetype of earth is the great mother the great mother earth is the center around which actually all of the, the elements uh, move around. The season of the earth is late summer. So this is after the, the highest point of summer when the most fire is expressed, it's starting to descend. It's, it's autumn, uh, not quite autumn, it's a harvest season. We also call this doyo, um, the season between seasons. So earth is simultaneously the harvest season, you think of the great mother, the nurturing type with all the foods and nourishment. This is the earth element, um, that harvest season. But it's also the season between seasons. It's the access point, this pivot point between seasons. So the organs associated with earth are stomach and spleen. This has to do with our digestion. Earth is constantly transforming everything we give it to it. So if you think of putting a pile of compost outside, you almost don't even have to do anything sometimes, but just let it decompose and re get redigested into the earth and it becomes soil. And then it becomes you know, fertilizer and then it becomes food and nourishment. All of these are earth element associations. So the emotion, if we're talking psychologically, the emotion associated with the earth element is sympathy. It's being able to um, care for other people and, uh, and causes to, to care, sympathy. Uh, it's also associated with worry and rumination. So you might think of this in the body, if you're not digesting your food properly and it's going round and round in circles, uh, but not properly digesting the nourishment out of it, you're kind of worrying. It's that same quality of worrying. You're just thinking about the same thing, cyclical thoughts but not really getting anything nourishing out of it. That's an earth type thing. When we'd wanna look at what's going on with your stomach and spleen, if you were to come in for a treatment, for example, uh, for Chinese medicine. 
the personality type is the motherly type, um, whether you're male or female or anything in between. Um, sweet, their personality is sweet, nurturing, they're giving, um, and they're constantly wanting to help other people and be supportive. The virtues, uh, this enlightened wisdom of the fire element type is selflessness. Um, they know that in the giving, there's always receiving. So there's a quality of reciprocity. There's integrity there. So they're not over giving beyond their capacity. They're not giving to the point of burning themselves out, but they give uh, what they can and in turn receive, um, knowing that the giver and the receiver are equal. That's the enlightened wisdom quality of the earth element. The challenges that might arise from an earth element that's out of balance is stickiness um to being maybe tit for tat well i gave you this and you owe me that for example um, selfishness thinking only about oneself um, meeting only what your own needs and not meeting other people's needs and this this uh idea of neediness of constantly needing more and more it's never enough when the enlightened quality or the virtue of the earth element is that of it is enough, I have enough and I can give from this place of enoughness. Um, so community connection, uh, being uh, deep, having tie, deep connections with community, cultivating community, cultivating the earth, gardening, these are all important things to an earth element type person. They love being with people and being that kind of solid um, center point. So the energy of earth is, is slower moving, kind of like mud, um, for example, um, that's rich in nourishment and it's heavy, it's solid. It's just an earth element type person is just there in the middle and people kind of gravitate around them, just like a mother with her children. Um, so that's it, I'll say, that's all I'll say for earth element. And we'll go on to metal. So earth creates metal as it condenses. Metal is this quality of preciousness. What is precious and rare? So metals, you can think of diamonds, crystal, gold, platinum. These are things that are made in the earth itself. It's condensed earth into all these minerals and nutri uh, nutrients as well. We need minerals for our own nourishment. Um, and so the season associated with the metal element is autumn. So we go from that peak of fire, heat, summer, to earth, which is late summer, harvesting the nourishment, bringing it into our lives, getting fed. And then we go into autumn where we shed our leaves. We see the, the trees outside are releasing their leaves. And, um, and we also can let go a little bit more as we start to move into winter season. So this preciousness, this rarity of the autumn season is we start to shed all of the excess and start to find what's really most important to us. So the organs associated with the metal element are the lungs and large intestine. This has to do with our breath. So the lung is how we take that fresh breath of life into us, the air chi, the chi of air, and that fuels us, that gives us energy. And then the large intestine is the other side. So there's air coming in and waste going out. So we're taking in what's fresh, what's new, what's vital and important to us and releasing what is waste, what no longer serves us. This is the, the quality of lung and large intestine with the metal element, releasing what is not precious and not rare we let that go um okay and the emotion associated with this metal element is poignancy and grief so why poignancy when something is poignant we recognize wow this is something so rare and so precious and i'm going to appreciate it while it's here and i can't hold on to it i will have to let it go ultimately uh, but i'm going to appreciate it while i can the sense of poignance um, and also this aspect of grief. Grief is important for us to experience as human beings. So grief is this quality of being able to let go and grieve something that we really cared about and loved and valued. So it is that this quality of letting go, um, grieving. The personality of a metal element type person 
is a person who's highly organized and structured. They're efficient, they're very clear minded, and they might be a connoisseur. Somebody who knows everything about what the one thing, uh, a wine connoisseur or a jeweler, for example, these are metal element type people. Um, because if you think of metal also, how are great buildings created? Through metal structures. We have steel beams that create structure in our lives, uh, structure in the world, but then metal in our bodies creates these structures, these rhythms of life the breath coming in, the breath going out. It's a steady rhythm that continues. So, yes, the personality type is this kind of stru highly organized, structured person who knows what's most valuable. They're the connoisseur. The virtues of a metal element type person are self-worth. Uh, well, the virtues of anybody with this with metal element, everyone has all of these elements, is a recognition of self-worth knowing you're worthy, recognizing what's of value in your life, in your community, in your job, in everything all around you, recognizing what's valuable and going towards that, recognizing what's valuable, letting go of what's not valuable. Maybe something was valuable once, uh, it was important to you at one time, but then no longer is, you have the capacity to release and let that go, whatever that is. And then righteousness. This is a, an aspect of, um, of, of discernment, really, the sense of righteousness uh, for the metal element. And then, so some of the challenges of a metal element that's out of balance might be emotional coldness. Um, that means a lack of warmth when there's uh, this constant feeling of, um, example, um, letting, letting go too much for example. Um, so cold, just like metal itself can be cold, a cold, you know, steel beam is so, so sharp that it doesn't, you don't feel that kind of interpersonal warmth sometimes. Um, it can be emotional coldness. Zealotry um, that has to do with how metal element type people might be so uh, fixed on what they think is the most valuable and the most precious, that they don't allow space for anything else uh, of value to come in and can be overly detached. So metal element type people might be the minimalists where they have, um, you know, almost a totally sparse home with very little uh, objects or items in the home, for example, um, or overly detached in their interpersonal relationships, knowing that all things come and go. Um, in this cycle of birth and death. This is also a topic of the metal element, re recognizing that preciousness and, and poignancy. So they might be a little too detached and lack that kind of personal warmth. And then hypercriticism, if they know what's the best of the best and the most rare and fine quality, they might be hypercritical of everything that is lesser than that. Um, so metal element also has to do with money, finances and wealth. Um, that is how we, we, we value things, typically, in this world. Um, all right, so I hope that's making sense for all of you. Um, I will go on. The color being white and gray, just like metal or crystal, a quartz or diamond crystal, for example. Okay, so I'll go on to our next one. We have water is next. Water here, think of the ocean. There's so much to the ocean. The quality of water is stillness within our depths. Water is that capacity to go deep within ourselves into our truth, into the depths of our inner knowing um, and to live from that place. So the season associated with water is wintertime. So we went from autumn, metal so just like the leaves are shed we come into this place of poignancy with metal recognizing what's most important in life and then moving into winter season when all that energy goes deep within us so in winter time we tend to be more reflective we stay inside a lot more unless you're outdoorsy and active but we tend to stay inside and hibernate a lot of animals are hibernating in the winter. We're going within, we're going deep within. So the organs associated with the water element are bladder and kidney. 
this might be kind of obvious to you. Why the bladder? Well, it holds the water waste in our body, right? The urine, that's the water, and releases it. Um, kidneys are filtering the water in the body. Um, there are deeper aspects to the kidney that have to do with our essence. Um, this is a Chinese medicine uh, understanding of this essential quality of who we are. Um, I won't go into that. That's for another workshop. Um, but so these are the water organs. Of course, any medical conditions around any of these organs, you'd want to look at each of these elements to understand what's going on within their relative balance of things. The emotion associated with the water element is fear and trembling. So imagine um, there's an endless ocean and we don't know what's on the other side. We don't know what's deep lurking in the dark depths. We don't really know. And so we might feel this fear. We might feel this trembling of the unknown. And ultimately, um, that'll bring me to the personality type. So personality of a water element is deep. Uh, they're philosophical, they're contemplative. They're probably a meditator. They love to meditate. They love um, thinking deeply and sitting with, with questions of inquiry into the nature of things. Um, they might be secretive, um, which is not a bad thing. The secretiveness is, is resting in your depth. And they're reflective. So they might be reflective back to you, some part of yourself. Um, they're reflective within, their, within themselves. And this brings us to the wisdom of the, the virtues of the water element, which is wisdom, transforming fear of the unknown into wisdom, um, resting in the unknown, resting in uncertainty, being okay with not knowing everything about everything or not knowing what's out there or what's possible. The other virtue is having a clear willpower. So just like a rushing river, it has a strength to it. So uh, a healthy water element has this kind of inner strength of willpower that has the capacity to bring forth our inner potential, our potential to manifest ourselves in this world, to manifest our truth. So the challenges of a water element when it's out of balance have to do with maybe being too powerful, overpowering others with your willpower, for example or fluctuating between the extremes of being overly conservative, that is living in a place of fear and uh, being conservative or not willing to take any risks into the next step of the unknown, or being overly reckless, just leaping headfirst into the unknown and not really taking time to really consider it or to think, think about what you're doing, for example. Um, another challenge might be financial or emotional insecurity, just this fundamental sense of like, I'm not really okay with who I am or being in this world with, because it's unknown, it's kind of big, scary place we live in. So these are some of the challenges of when water element is out of balance in our bodies and minds. Um, some other associations, the color is blue, black, just like the ocean, the water. Cold is the quality of water, um, just like the winter time when we're going deep within our depths, coldness. Ice is freezing. You know, when we get so scared, we just freeze like ice. Um, this is also water element quality. Um, healthy water is flowing through life. Uh, there's the quality of stillness. And also, as I mentioned, contrasting that rush of um, that strength of willpower, just like a river rapids. The wisdom, another wisdom of water is using your resources wisely. So knowing what you have and, and using the resources that are there um, with wisdom and discernment. And there's a natural self-assuredness to a water element type person. And that's about it. There's a aspects of flowing stream, the crashing waves, waves, as I mentioned. All right, so moving on to our last but not least element here is the wood element. So the wood element is all about growth and direction. The wood element, if you think of a strong tree, right? Roots planted deep, 
strong trunk, growing branches outwards, reaching to the sun, right? This, this reaching, stretching out, okay? So we are in the wood element full time right now. Spring time is a wood element. You can see this is the time when everything is coming alive, growing. Um, so the organ associated with wood element is the liver and the gallbladder. Um, this has to do with our ability to move freely in the world, to stretch, to, um, to vision. Um, again, I won't go into why those organs, why this element, uh, because that's a whole other course in, itself, in and of itself, but reach out to me if you do have those specific questions or feel free to put them in the chat box too. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that. But um, liver and gallbladder and the emotion associated with wood is anger and assertion. You think about anger, there's a lot of energy behind anger. It has a direction. Uh, it's like, we're going this way. This is what's happening. This is the way it should be in the world. Or you should not do that. Anger is strong and directive. Um, just like a sprout that bursts out of uh, a seed shell. It has to have a little energy to go, boop, grow upwards. So there's this upwards movement of, of uh, the wood element. Assertion, being able to say, this is the way that it is. This is right. This is wrong. These are qualities of wood element. Personality of a wood element type is driven. They're commanding. They might be the CEO, the boss, the manager. Um, these are good qualities of a wood element type person. They know how to take command and say, this is what's happening. And they're visionary. Um, this is especially true of a liver type person. They're visionary. They love to make plans and look ahead to where they're growing, the direction that they're growing into. So the virtue, the, the virtuous qualities of, of, of wood uh, are benevolence, compassion, um, doing things for the benefit of others, not just for the benefit of yourself, but doing things that are beneficial. Um, having clear direction and flexibility, just like the nature of bamboo. So I like to use this example because it's so, it's so perfect for, for the wood element. Um, the nature of bamboo is strong, it grows rapidly, and it has flexibility within this. So it has a direction, it's growing upwards towards its best life, you could say, towards its best expression. It's growing upwards, but it has the flexibility to bend and sway when things change. So the opposite of that would be the challenge of a wood element type person, which is rigidity, being fixated, saying it's only this one way and it can't be any different. Well, what happens when we're challenged by a storm? What happens when we're moved by the winds of life? We might snap in anger. We might break. And that's not so good. We don't want that. We want to have flexibility. Um, and the discernment to know when do we stand our ground, when do we have flexibility to change plans, to change directions as needed. Um, so another challenge, again, of, um, of the wood element type person might be snapping or explosiveness in anger or belligerence, um, blind rage, for example. This is wood element totally out of balance. Then the another side of that out of balance aspect of wood is timidity being too shy or not willing to assert yourself and say this is what i feel is right or this is wrong um, indecisiveness just not being able to make a choice a good healthy wood element type person knows the right choices to make that will benefit others that will benefit if you're the ceo that will benefit the company if you're the manager it will help create more harmony in your workplace this is the healthy uh, wood element. A wood element type person um, has a, a clear sense of judgment. Um, so they might be a judge in the court. They might be a lawyer. Um, they have that sense of right and wrong, but within the wisdom of it is right and wrong within a broader sense of uh, the broader arc of the universe. So knowing that um, even if something wrong does happen, eventually that will be righted in the expansive in the arc of, of moral justice, you could say. So a wood element type person might also be an advocate for social justice issues. 
They have this sense of, of justice, and right and wrongness. So I hope that makes sense. Um, that brings us to conclusion. I haven't talked about, I've mentioned um, in each of these, the movement of the Tao that's a little bit deeper and more complex. So I decided to skip that for today. That's a, like I said, another workshop in and of itself. But I hope that gives you a good overview of each of these five elements and what they entail. Um, Cause it's really such a rich field of knowledge uh, that could get us more in touch with ourselves, with the world. Um, and to just help us understand from this viewpoint, from this Chinese medicine perspective, um, a little bit, you know, a, a new angle of, of seeing ourselves in the world. So I'm open to questions now. If any of you have, um, if you have any, any feedback or any questions, I'm happy to answer that. And then at the very end, I will share with you a few upcoming events that I have, uh, that I have going. So Feel free to, if you have any questions, open up your microphone too, if you prefer to speak it out or let me know anything in the chat. If you have any questions or comments. Hi, um, I kind of came in a little late. I'm not sure if you said it in the beginning, but I did enjoy your presentation of each element. Um, my question is, how would you know which one of the elements that you kind of lean more towards or that's, embody? Yeah. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. So this is something that I do. Um, I'm working one on one with clients. Um, I would say first to schedule an appointment with me. I do offer five element consultations. And during these consultations, we will go in depth into understanding what your, your constitutional type is, your uh, five element type is. And what that, what you would be doing and what we do in consultations um, is to look at your daily cycle. I showed you that chart. Look at the daily cycle. Look at when your energy is most, um, most amplified, most radiant, when you have the most energy through your day, when you have the least amount of energy, when you feel off, or if you have repeating patterns going on, like every day at, you know, at 3 p.m., I need to take a nap or I need a coffee or I'm always waking up at 2 a.m. every single night. These are signs of what's going on with your elements and can give us more information about what type you are. Um, another way to assess what your five element type is, um, is looking at your, your belief system, your mind and your psychology. What are some of the, the ways that you um, what are some of your life stories? What's kind of like your life thesis? Uh, that drives your motivations, that drives your, um, your compulsions, your habits, your inclinations. What do you lean more towards? And also, you might just look at this very simply and say, what's my favorite color? Or, uh, like, what are some things that just resonate the most with me? Uh, but this is just a very brief way of, of coming to understand what your five element type is. And I would suggest just booking an appointment with me to do that um, because this is something that I specialize in and I love sharing with people because it's such, I've gotten so many people over the years and they're like, how do I know what element I am? Am I this one? Am I that one? And I love discerning that with, with people because I think once you really go deep into understanding your constitutional type, your five element type, then you can, um, then you can really uh, understand so much more about yourself and bring yourself more into balance, into harmony. Um, so there's also ways to remedy if certain elements are out of balance once you know that, um, once you know which one you are. And the other interesting thing is that we're usually, um, we have usually one primary element type and a secondary element type um, where there's one element type that is most predominant through the whole arc of our lives from birth up to present day. Um, but you might notice some running themes throughout your life where you're like, yeah, I had a phase in my life where I was a little bit more one element or I'm primarily this one element, but then I also noticed this other one underneath and, you know, all of that is part of your, you know, your whole makeup of what makes you, you. And I see a few comments. Thank you so much. Very informative. Thank you, Ruby. And is the remedy for an imbalance usually herbal, physical, et cetera? It can be any and all of those, actually. Um, so remedies could be anything from daily lifestyle shifts, of shifting your sleep patterns, to shifting your diet, 
um, can be herbal medicine through Chinese medicine, could be treatments like shiatsu, which is what I practice, could be acupuncture, um, could be physical as well, um, doing specific exercises can also shift your elemental balance, specific, um, let's see, uh, specific yogas also have different elemental qualities. Uh, so remedying and working on any of the, uh, on the relative balance of any of these elements um, can come in a number of ways and through a number of, of methods. So hope that answers your question. So you always, yes, you're so welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And so, great. Um, how and when is this model superior to Western medicine? Wow, good question. I might get in trouble saying that it's superior, but um, I like to actually, uh, I like to say that it can work in harmony and in conjunction with Western medicine. Um, I, I am an advocate for natural medicine, um, first and foremost, that is my field. Um, but I know that Western medicine is so vital and important, and it really is, um, it really is, you're welcome, really is such a, um, a wonderful thing that has brought us so many solutions to, to physical ailments. But I like to say in terms of Chinese medicine, the understanding is, a superior, let's say physician, a superior, superior medical practitioner is treating first and foremost the spirit. Western medicine rarely, I would say, in my opinion, rarely treats the spirit. And so what does that mean to me? Um, it's, it's approaching life from a holistic perspective, not compartmentalizing things into mental health, physical health, we're gonna treat this organ, you go to this specialist for that organ. It's seeing the whole picture of your life within body, mind, spirit, and within the context of your environment, where you live. Also, you know, if you're living in the Mediterranean uh, where it's hot and damp all the time and you have a damp condition where you have edema all of the time, you need to move to a drier climate or you live in a dry climate and you're having, you know, rashes and your skin is peeling, maybe move to a warmer climate. So it's looking at the whole picture, looking at the environment, looking at your community, your relationships with your family members, um, and all of that to really treat the spirit first and foremost um, from this wider perspective. Uh, and then after that, then you go to the, the treatment of the physical body, then you go to the treatment of um, disease, finally. Um, so this is a preventative medicine system. This is why I say maybe I might get in trouble again saying this, but it might be superior just in terms of it being a preventative medical model where the object, the objective is essentially to maintain health, longevity, and vitality. The last thing that we want to do is treat illness and disease because already if you've gotten to the point of illness and disease, you have not been taken care of beforehand and you need to seek the medical attention and seek support, seek, seek practitioners who can help you get right um, with, with spirit, for lack of better terms, get right with spirit so that you are bringing forward your vitality and harmonizing with these elements, harmonizing with your life and all the aspects of your life um, so that it doesn't ever get to the point of disease or illness. I think that's where, um, some of these holistic medicines uh, and traditional medicines, not just Chinese medicine, but ind indigenous medicine as well, Ayurveda, um, all of these medicines can be very helpful and very informative to Western medicine. And I think Western medicine could probably learn a lot from this kind of view of understanding life and health. Um, not so much treatment of symptoms, but um, prevention um, and balance before we ever get to any symptoms. So. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. And um, yeah, any other questions? I'm happy to answer. Oh, you're so welcome. All right. And if all goes back to fire in the beginning, uh, once we've healed the metal, the earth, etc., do you see you have to work through each element to get back to the source fire? Ah, Julie asking the deeper questions here. So, there is another model of understanding that I haven't touched on yet. That is the movement of the Tao. And the movement of the Tao is essentially we're always returning to source. 
we're always returning to our essential nature, which is the embodiment of truth, of wisdom, of our light. Um, and so there's nothing essential you have to do. You don't have to do anything to get back to the source or get back to that starting point, for example, the origin, your original nature. But it's a natural process that happens as all of these elements begin to harmonize. Um, I think I'm going to save this for a future workshop uh, <laughs> because we can go much more in depth with this idea of what it means to, to heal all of these elements and to return to original nature, return to, um, you could say, the Tao. And that is being in harmony with Dharma. For me, this is the same kind of synonymous. Um, variation of expression of how it shows up in the world but very similar so yeah those are yeah that's it all right <laughs> well if there aren't any further questions i will share with you some upcoming events that i have um, if any of you are interested in participating um, and thank you all so much for being here. Um, it's been so wonderful to be able to speak on this subject. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, and please do reach out as well. You've got my website here, livingheartcentered.com. Um, I do one-to-one -one sessions, uh, hands-on shiatsu therapy, as well as coaching, uh, this holistic health coaching and these five element consultations. If you wanna meet with me to discover what your five element type is in depth, and so the upcoming events I have are a women's circle. We've called the Enlightened Feminine Women's Circle um, in person in Evanston. Um, I may be offering it hybrid. So if you are feeling really called to join that, um, it, it will be Sunday, May 22nd. Feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is also livingheartcentered at gmail.com, the same as my website. And then I have a workshop um, coming up on the five elements. We're going in depth into the fire element. Um, and I will be offering these seasonally. So we'll do fire in the summertime. We'll go in depth into fire, getting into all the nitty gritty details about fire um, and what it means to express our radiance, to discover our truth and to embody joy, which are all the qualities of fire, the fire element, summer sun summer sunshine. And that's going to be Saturday, June 18th from 11 to 1230. Uh, it'll be online through Zoom. So you're welcome to join wherever you are. Um, $40 is the early bird special, which will go up to 55 after the end of this month. And then I have a uh, heart healing journey, which is a six month one to one program um, for cultivating your wisdom and clearing through obstacles that might be in your path. Um, this is an online ongoing one to one um, uh, healing, coaching, mentorship program. Uh, so if you feel ready to go really deep and go really far in your life, whatever it is that you're healing mentally, emotionally and physically, um, I'm here to offer guidance and support for that. So feel free to reach out to me and you can find out more about all of this information on my website. Right there, livingheartcenter.com. And thank you all so much for being here. See you next time. Yes, thank you.